Okay, so now we have seen a lot about how you declare and define functions and what they look like in C. We also need to understand a little bit about the runtime or the runtime support for functions, right? What actually happens when I call a function, okay? Now, in order to properly understand that, we also need to think in terms of what exactly are, what is there in the memory of a computer when it's running a program, right? And as we have seen already, if I think of this overall block out here as the memory available to a computer, some of it stores code, which is basically instructions, and some of it stores data, right? So the code basically consists of executable instructions and the data is what the instructions operate upon, right? Primarily variables and other forms of data. It could also be like strings, constant values, various other things that are required for the operation of the program, right? Now, one of the questions that needs to be answered over here is, right, all of this looks like a big block of memory, right? What happens to a variable? Where do those variables actually go? And what variables or what data should any given function be allowed to see, right? Because after all, in any given computer's memory, there will also be other programs that are present at, a, at any given point in time, right? And you don't always want any function to be able to see what other functions are working on, right? Not only are there, I mean, there can be all kinds of security issues that come about as a result of that, right? It is possible that the program can crash in different ways or that certain information that should not be revealed to the outside world actually leaks, right? So how we end up arranging the code and the data in the memory of the computer is something that we actually need to understand in order to fully appreciate how functions work. So this notion of calling a function, the terms that we use are typically either call or invoke a function, right? And both of them basically say that the code corresponding to the function has to be loaded somewhere in memory. Now, how does this actually happen in practice? What does this compiler produce as output? For each given C file, it produces some object code and then there is a linker that takes all those object codes together and puts them together into an executable file, right? So that's what is actually happening in the process of creating an executable. And when I try running that program, the operating system takes that executable code, loads it up into memory, right? And updates a few sort of entries here and there in the memory that tell the system where to find a given function, for example, right? So within that code, there would typically be some kind of a lookup table that, for example, says, if you want the printf function, look in this address. If you want the scanf function, look in this address. If you want the square root function, look in this address and so on, okay? So lookup tables are used and they are maintained as some part of the executable file, which basically tell us, if I want to call a particular function, this is the address in memory where the instructions of that function are, which means that in order to run that function, I would need to branch there and run the code that I see there. Now, along with being able to just jump to the code and start executing instructions, I also want to be able to pass in arguments. And there are a couple of different ways of doing this. One of them is we take each argument, especially if it's an integer or something like that, put it into a register, right? Because as we have already seen, the CPU, the processor has a large number of registers and maybe some of those registers could be reserved and said, you know, these are going to act as arguments of functions. So I put it into a register, I call the function and the function knows that this particular register will have the arguments that it needs. How does it know? After all, the compiler is creating the code for it. The compiler knows how the caller, that is to say the one that's actually going to call the function how is it going to pass the argument? Is it by putting it into a register and if so, into which register? And the callee, that is the function that is being called, also will be written in such a way that, or created by the compiler in such a way that it gets its argument from the correct place, right? So that part of it, making sure that the argument is in the right place as seen by both the caller and the callee is something that compilers have to do properly. Now, what happens if you are trying to link your code against something that somebody else wrote and maybe compiled with a different compiler. That's where once again, 
conventions come in, right? So most compilers agree on what's called a binary interface, which says this is where I'm going to place my arguments and this is how you need to return values. And as long as all compilers sort of follow the same approach, they can interface with each other quite neatly. Once again, for the time being, you don't need to go deep into that part of it. We will be looking at some of those aspects a little bit more perhaps later. But for now, what is important is I could either put an argument into a register or I could put it in some place in memory and tell the function which I'm calling that this part of memory belongs to you. This is where your arguments are and this is what you can use for computation. Now, apart from passing in arguments, you also want to get values back, right? And how do you pass the values back? Once again, you could either use a register or you could write into a specific location in memory and say, you know, this is the return value of the function, right? Potentially, if you were writing something in memory, you could even have something which takes multiple bytes or multiple words and possibly try and return multiple words that way, right? Except that that's not a very straightforward and easy thing to do in the C language. The main point that you need to keep in mind over here is using any function involves a little bit of an understanding of how the memory of the computer looks, right? The function, in other words, needs to have some part of memory that is allocated for it so that it can use it for creating variables, for storing things, for performing functions and so on, for getting arguments and for returning values. So that interface between the processor and the memory and how they are used by the function is something which is actually an important part of how the program works. Now, the scope of visibility of a given variable is something that we have already sort of uh, seen uh, before, right? And this is just sort of to emphasize that, let's say that I have two different functions, f1 and f2, and f2 actually calls f1, right? So you could call this, for example, the caller, and this would be the callee. Right? because I'm calling it here, right? So the caller now has a notion of a variable called A, but what we are saying is that this variable called A, which is there inside the callee, is visible only inside the callee and is completely different from the one that is seen by the caller, right? So just like any other notion of variable scope, where we say that there is limited visibility to the outside world, the same thing happens over here as well, right? Because after all, a function can be thought of as any other block of code in C and blocks essentially do a good job of hiding the variables that are inside them. Now, as I said, you need to pass parameters into a function. You also need to get values out of that function, okay? And in between those, a function might declare a variable like A where does this go? You could take the decision that, hey, this is just it's somewhere in memory, I don't really care where. But what I would like to do is to actually have a specific portion of the memory that is safe, that this particular function can use, that no one else is going to accidentally mess up. And in fact, other functions can't even see what's going on in there, right? The way that that is done is that we create something called a stack frame, right? So the runtime of the C language, basically what it does is it allots some memory to each and every function that is being called when it is being called, not ahead of time. Only when the function is being called, it allots memory to it. And all the variables that are used by that function end up inside that allotted memory, right? In order to visualize this, there is this nice website called pythontutor.com, which is actually primarily meant for visualizing how Python programs work, but also has a very nice section that can help you to visualize how C programs work. So we are going to use that in order to understand where variables get created and what the idea of a stack frame is in the context of a function. Okay, so as you can see over here, the pythontutor.com website, right? In this case, it allows you to visualize code in Python, JavaScript, C, C++, and Java. We are going to use C 
in particular as you can see we have a few different options out here but it's just basically we are going to use the default which is the C17 plus GNU extensions. What that means is C17 is the version of the language standard that we are following and the GNU extensions, the GNU project or the GNU project is one of the sort of you know, the original free software projects, right? Free as in the concept of the freedom of software, which was uh, started way back in the 1980s and is responsible for a lot of what we now call sort of the open source movement, right? In some sense, but GNU basically is something primarily related to the philosophical idea of the freedom of software. GCC is part of the GNU software collection and is one of the most well-known C compilers. In this case, what they are doing is they are going to be using this, that as the C compiler in order to generate code. But we don't really need to worry about all of that. What we are primarily concerned about is can we use this in order to help understand how the different parts of a program work. Okay. So this is what the code looks like, right? I've just written a small piece of code out here. There is one function which basically takes an argument x, computes x into x and returns the value y. And in the main function, I declare an int x, I then say declare another variable y and square of x and then do a printf and so on. One of the things you might wonder over here is, why did I have to declare int y is equal to over here? I could have just done return x into x, right? And yes, that would have worked perfectly fine. The reason for declaring int y will become apparent in a moment, right? Basically what I'm trying to do is I want to show you that y now becomes a specific variable that is now present in the stack frame of the function square, right? And similarly, when I declare two variables x and y out here, each of them gets some space in the stack frame of the function main, right? And as a result of doing that, it then goes, you know, I can uh, go through and visualize what these values are at any given point in time. Okay, so let's try running this. When I click on visualize execution, right, so what it has done over there is it went ahead, compiled it, and now it has this entire code that I had written out here. And this red arrow that you see on the left hand side is pointing to where I am in the code. Uh, those of you who have worked with any kind of debugger might have you know, noticed that this looks sort of like what you would do if you were single stepping through a piece of code, right? This is actually a very sophisticated piece of software. What it has done is it has already figured out the exact set of steps that your program will take in order to run. And it has essentially quantified all of them. So you have step one of nine out here. Basically it says that within nine steps it will complete the execution of the program and it's going to show you every one of those steps and allow you to walk both forwards and backwards within the execution of the program, right? Now, the interesting thing of course is right now I'm starting with this function main and what you can see out here is there is this thing called the stack, right? And where it says that you have main and main has two variables, x and y. Both are of type int and both have unknown values right now because they have not been given values, okay? At this point, of course, I have not even entered the function the reason why it knows that main has this kind of a stack is because it has already gone and profiled the entire thing. Now it also has something else called heap over here. Ignore this for now, we'll get to it later when we actually start using, when we look deeper into how memory is managed in the running of a program. All right, so let me start running this. I click on next and what happens is it runs through into this particular line nine, it points over here, okay? And when I execute this line, right now X is still showing a question mark. It has not yet been initialized because I have not yet run line nine. But once I run it, I get the value 10 sitting out here. Okay. Now, the next line says int Y is equal to square of X. Ideally, it should just execute this or possibly it might just execute this as a single line. But in this case, it's going to do single stepping, which means that when it sees a function called, it will actually jump into that function. Let's see what happens when, so in other words, what is happening is I am inside main right now and I'm calling another function. Let's see what happens. Now you notice that something else popped up over here, right? What has happened is I'm now in another function and that function has its own stack frame, right? 
So, this part out here is the stack frame corresponding to main, this part out here is the stack frame corresponding to square. I have just entered the function, so neither x nor y actually have a value yet, okay. But as soon as I enter it, I find that x came in as a parameter and had the value 10. Now I have got this int y is equal to x into x, it is pretty much going to straight away compute that value and say y is equal to 100, okay. I am still inside the square function, so at the main level, y is still a question mark, I have not updated this. So the y that I see inside square and the y that I see inside main are different. In fact, as we will see later, they actually point to different physical addresses even, okay. Alright, so right now I am still inside this function square. What happens if I continue with this? It says I have got to the point of returning, I have reached the last line of this code. Okay, let us leave and when I leave immediately I see that this line 10 has now been completed. Y has got the value 100 which it got from as a return value of the function and now I am ready to go ahead and print something, okay. Let us continue. The print results in this line coming up here, right. So the square of 10 is 100, that is basically what I wanted it to print and it is now reached the last step, step 9 of 9, which is to exit the main function, that is it, we are done, right. The interesting thing about this of course is I can even go backwards, right, I can sort of walk back into the function, well not exactly, I mean it pretty much walks directly back all the way through, it does not go back into square. But I can once again repeat the whole thing and see that I go into square, perform the computation, return the value and y gets updated and prints out its value out here, okay. So the main reason for bringing this up was to sort of make it explicit what the notion of a stack frame is, right. You actually have something which says that each function when it is being called has a certain area of memory that is just allocated for the use of that function. Any variable that the function uses finds place in that memory block, right. And the stack frame corresponding to square is different from the stack frame corresponding to main. Even though the variables are named the same, they actually could easily have different values. So as we saw in the example, the stack frame is allocated every time a function is called. You might have noticed that the square function stack frame only came into existence when I actually called square. So it is not like ahead of time I had allocated certain memory and said that whenever square is being called I will use this memory. When I call the function it allocates the memory and says okay now go ahead and use it, right. That is actually an important thing to keep in mind as we will see in the next section because it allows us to call a function more than once, right. Now stack frames are typically allocated in chunks of a fixed size that is determined by the compiler and the operating system. Right? And now there are a lot of other conventions that you might need to follow, right. When I am actually calling a function, what are the parts that I as the caller need to keep safe because after all I am transferring control to some other part of the code. There might be some intermediate registers or some other values that I was using that I want to keep them safe. Anything which is sitting in memory is anyway safe because you know the new function will get its own stack frame. But what about my registers? There were 32 of the registers, I must have been using them for something. And what happens there is, there are again conventions that come into play. In some cases what we say is most registers are not going to be, you know, kept safe. But if you want to keep some register safe, because you know that you will need that value when you come back from whatever function you called then you need to save it somewhere else because the other function that you are calling might overwrite that register. So when you call a function, you first save whatever you need for yourself, jump to the address of that function, let it do whatever it wants. When it comes back, you restore all your registers from wherever you kept them safe and proceed. 